Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pavel Levitsky. I'm the Associate Director of the European Studies Center. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all in the first iteration of our new lecture series called the EU Enlargement Victor Virtual Lecture Series 20th Anniversary of the EU Enlargement. Um, so as probably most of you know, next year marks 20th anniversary of the biggest enlargement of the European Union in its history. Um, when 10 new member states, eight of them post-socialist member states, um, entered the Union. Together with Center for Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies at the University of Pittsburgh, we want to use this opportunity to take stock of the enlargement and consider its consequences. We are zooming into each country or sub-region to take a closer look at the changes of the, that the EU evoked, but we also want to extrapolate these dynamics and changes onto the whole union and see how the union changed in course and after the enlargement. Please check our website regularly for more details on the series. Um, today, we are focusing on Poland, the biggest um, member state that um, entered the union at that time. And we have two distinguished guests that I would like to welcome. Our uh, first guest is uh, Ambassador Janusz Reiter, who is a former ambassador, Polish ambassador to Germany and the United States. Janusz Reiter graduated German studies at the University of Warsaw in 1977. Before he became an ambassador to Germany in the years 1919 and 19, between 1990 and 1995, he worked as a journalist. Mr. Reiter was actively engaged in the rebuilding process of Polish-German relations. In 1996, he founded the Center for International Relations, which is an independent think tank focusing on foreign and security policies. Um, he was head of the center for 11 years. In year 2005, Mr. Reiter became uh, the Polish ambassador to the, to the, United, to the United States. And in 2008, a special emissary of the Polish government for climate policies in this, and in this capacity, he participated in the preparation of the climate change conferences in Poznań and Copenhagen. Our second, second guest today is Dr. Anna Horolec from the Institute of Ethnology and Cultural Anthropology at the University of Warsaw. Um, Dr. Horolec is an assistant professor at this institute. Um, Anna is an author of a book, Obrazy Europy w Polskim Dyskursie Publicznym, which translates into English images of Europe in Polish public discourse. She has done research on post-accession um, migration among Polish migrants in the UK and the United States, as well as among Vietnamese and Ukrainian mi migrants in Poland. Recent research projects are on the media and inter institutional reactions to the so-called refugee crisis in Europe and on urban green spaces in Poland and Slovenia, as well as on leisure and good life. Her research interests includes also discourse analysis and Europeanization, and her articles have appeared in Europe East European politics and societies and leisure, leisure sciences, to name just a few. Thank you once again for um, accepting our invitation. Now, to start the session, I prepared some of slides to give the audience and everyone some background on the facts and you know numbers. I will just start my my slides. So you know a lot. I guess a lot of people ask. And the question is, you know, what were the, um, so what was the surplus? And um, if you look at the web pages um, for, of the European uh, Union, you know, official web pages, it says, um, you know, that the countries that the, entered the Union had the opportunity to shape EU policies, um, their um, political stability and, and economic uh, stability increased as well as security. It enabled free flow of goods, services, capital, and people, but also, as we know, um, massive migration, and increased um, direct investment into Polish economy, 
Um, and then also, you know, the transfer, it enabled transfer of funds um, to, to the country. Let's have a look at the numbers. Um, so up till year 2020, there were 235 billion euros transferred to the to Poland. There of 157 billion towards cohesion policy. Cohesion policy is this policy that aims at uh, yeah, increasing the co cohesion between member states. So it's infra so it's uh, investment in infra infrastructures, uh, environment, education, um, entrepreneurship. Um, 74 billion euros were, went towards common agricultural policy. Um, the foreign direct investment um, rose, as you can see, from 13 billion dollars in 2004 to 34 billion dollars, or almost 35 in 2005 uh, uh, to 2023. And then, um, as you can see below, and I can't see it because I don't see the um, the numbers. <laughs> well, the GDP grew um, significantly. And then, um, so these transfers meant that um, Poland had surplus uh, of 157 billion euros uh, pumped into the country and into the economy. And here you can see the um, the numbers referring to gross domestic pro product in total and per capita. So, and then, you know, from 50% EU average to almost 80%, which is a significant growth. Now, these are the numbers, and this is what you see on the web pages praising the, you know, the um, good sides of the of the EU accession and membership. But maybe you can tell, and I'm addressing both of my our speakers today. Maybe you can tell, you know, what were the reasons and what people thought, and why they want, why Poles and the Polish society wanted to enter the union, and. Mr. Writer, maybe you can um, uh, start. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Um, when I was uh, uh, looking at your numbers, um, I was thinking about the mood in Poland, and uh, the numbers are not reflected in the mood in the country, but that's. Uh, maybe a story for later on. Uh, why did Poland want, one, why did such an overwhelming majority of the Polish people want to join the European Union? For my generation, this was uh, the dream of Europe, uh, very often called return to Europe, a very powerful message because it suggested that um, it was something uh, historically legitimate and something that uh, was not just about uh, a current uh, situation, which had a historical historic dimension. And it resonated very well back then in, uh, in the country. If you look at uh, the history of the European Union, at the motives why countries joined the European Union or um, previously communi European community, I think you can identify three motives. One, uh, the first one I would call a geopolitical one. The second one uh, was or is or has been about catching up with the richer, uh, better developed countries. And the third one could be called a pragmatic one. Uh, now, um, the, the geopolitical motive, um, this was the driving force of the European of, 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 the, of the European policy of countries like Germany, France, also the Benelux countries and Italy, but especially Germany and France, because for them, the European integration was about uh, changing 
the logic of the geopolitics of these two countries after uh, major wars that devastated uh, these two countries. This was this was a new idea of how to uh, how to come to a better model of uh, of a neighborhood of partnership, and it was very successful. The second motive. Um, catching up. This was the major motive for countries like Spain, Greece, Portugal. They wanted to accelerate their economic development by joining the European Union. And the third motive, the pragmatic one, I think was uh, responsible for the decision of joining the EU in Sweden, in the, in the Nordic countries, also in the UK. This is, of course, a special uh, uh, topic. Now, if you ask me which of the motives was uh, uh, the dominant one or was driving the Polish EU accession, I would say all three of them, all three of them. The geopolitical motive, absolutely dominant. This was about uh, what, changing or um, uh, redefining Polish geopolitics, especially while well, getting out of the traditional uh, position between East and West, between Russia and Germany. This was a very powerful message back then in Poland. Of course, also, it was also about catching up. Um, and the, the, the figures that you presented, uh, uh, they, they, they have a clear message, this was successful too. And the pragmatic motive, well, it was maybe less obvious back then, but I think it's uh, gaining more importance even now. So Poland had all three motives uh, when it joined the European Union. And finally, let me say, I still believe, despite the mood that uh, well, uh, I detect in the country, that Poland has been one of the most successful cases in the EU history. Maybe next to Germany, Poland is the greatest winner of the European Revolution after 1989 for reasons that I could speak long about, but let me just hint at it. I believe Poland is a success story. The problem is that the Polish people uh, do not remember that or have forgotten that. Mm. Thank you. Well, I think this is a really great overview, but we have here also Anna, who's an anthropologist. As an anthropologist, she's looking more carefully into and listening to what people say. Anna has written a book on images of Europe at that time. Anna, what do you think, or what can you tell us about the, the motives? So what have you found out in your research? Thank you for uh, uh, having me here, first and foremost, and for also um, allowing me to speak uh, um, on my research, which was uh, incidentally uh, based on press. And I would just corroborate what Ambassador Reiter just said. Uh, the hopefulness about the EU was overwhelming uh, during the um, pre-accession period, which I studied. Uh, and although there were various uh, fears, which actually, if we look at the fears of Europe today, would be pretty much the same repertoire uh, of what can go wrong. Uh, still, uh, Europe was quite central in uh, Polish imaginary of what's going to happen. And from the point of view of cultural mechanism that it sets forward, uh, Europe was a part of this uh, anticipating of a hopeful future and looking forward to something. It's exactly as the ambassador said, it was going away from the communist past, but also from the further past of the petitions and uh, being dominated um, and not being able to do things the way we want towards uh, something more uh, agentic. It was economic growth. Uh, I may remind you that towards 2004, the unemployment in Poland was about 20%. So it means that every fifth person was out of job at this time uh, of working age. And after joining the EU very quickly, this number dropped to 6%. So, I mean, totally reiterating what was just said, it was a success story. But what I wanted to add that the proximity to Europe as such and the proximity to Europe in uh, um, the, the form of European Union 
was a kind of double-edged sword because um, in the narratives and discourses around uh, European integration, the fears were um, voiced uh, mainly by very um, non-mainstream actors at that point in time. For example, in the sample I studied, there were very far-right uh, journals, uh, such as Myśl Polska and Polish Thought, uh, that uh, that spoke about uh, dominant Europe, Europe that would subsume uh, Poland, meaning the EU, of course. Uh, but they were very marginal, and they were somewhere uh, at, at, at the um, far, far end of the spectrum. But what was quite uh, central uh, was the discourse that um, Poland um, is a part of Europe, but sometimes we need to be ashamed of some parts of its practices, uh, of its um, population habits, politicians, uh, and, and certain features. So um, this discourse of shame uh, for Polish backwardness was also present in press representations that I studied. And on the one hand, it can be interpreted in terms of the proximity to Europe, that Poland was indeed a part of Europe, because you can be ashamed only of somebody, I mean, in front of somebody whom you consider close to, to self. So in this case, this discourse of shame for Polish backwardness was um, something that uh, signaled that Europe is very much part of uh, the imagination of who the Poland is, of what the Poland is. But also the downside was that it was creating a kind of internal other. This can be compared to what uh, Polish anthropologist Michał Buchowski described for the losers and winners of transformation. This internal other, was kind of a price to pay for joining uh, this better future, this hopeful uh, new life. And this more cultural take on this uh, process of becoming the part of Europe could su suggest to think of this process as being the predecessor of being the possible uh, reason why, why the enclaves of anti-Europeanness um, were left somewhere there and then were able to be um, developed um, for political motivations, most probably for some pragmatic motivations, necessarily for, for very deep anti-European mood and later become part of mainstream politics, such as was the case after the migration crisis in uh, 2015. And I will stop here. Hmm. All right. Um, so, um, so there was a moment of enthusiasm and, um, you know, a surge of, uh, um, need and the need to enter the union, um, a hope to, you know, to uh, develop, to, uh, become wealthier, to become part of the so-called quote unquote civilized world. And, um, I think, I think you, Anna, pointed to that, that there were already at that time pockets of skepticism, uh, although still at the, at the, you know, at the margins. Um, so I wonder if you could say anything about um, how, how this skepticism then, you know, developed and how it was able to expand or how and why um, it expanded expanded that something that we can see uh, in the current um politics if this is such a success story why why it's not right now or why it's in in uh, you know and what you see in the discourse political discourse it's not who wants to go first well, I think this is, uh, it is the, the key points in the entire Polish debates. And uh, well, um, you know, I remember uh, the first years, uh, Poland's first years in the, in the European Union. And I remember a discussion in which I said, well, the time of adaptation is over. This is now the time of making decisions. 
And I still believe that this was the key issue. And uh, I believe that, well, actually Poland uh, turned from the phase of adaptation, taking over this famous acquis communautaire to decision-making. But unfortunately in the public awareness, well, we still are in the adaptation mode. People believe that Poland is, that the Polish government still have to follow a kind of instructions from the European Commission and that it is a kind of national duty to, to defend the country from these external forces who want Poland to do exactly what is being done in Brussels or in Berlin or in Paris and so on and so on. And this is a complex. Um, in other words, uh, what we failed to develop is a, a strong sense of ownership in the European Union, or this sense of ownership is limited to the well to the elites, and it's not widespread in the in the society. And this is now being exploited in Polish politics, especially now in the election campaign. Mm. And to be frank, I'm not going to blame anybody for that, especially not uh, in other countries. But, you know, I remember uh, from, um, I don't know, I don't know exactly 20 years ago or 16 years ago like that, an interview in a major European newspaper with a major, former major European politician who said about his country, it was the Netherlands. My country is the most European country in Europe. And this uh, sentence reflected uh, the way of thinking that was very widespread in the Western uh, elites in Europe. And this was, this had, this had a horrible impact. What, what is the suggestion of this sentence? My country is the most European country in Europe. Well, the suggestion is that there are less European countries. And then uh, if uh, Europe is perceived this way, then of course, well, Polish people immediately have the suspicion that they are among the least European countries. And how can they accept that? And if you don't manage these emotions, uh, then they are managed by people who make use of them for their, their political agenda. And this is exactly what we are watching in Poland today. And also other countries in the region as well, but not also in Central and Eastern Europe or new member states or quote unquote new member states, but also old member states. And I think this is often um, forgotten that it's not something that can be contained into a particular group of countries. Anna, what do you think? I remember that uh, at certain point I read an article by an Estonian uh, political scientist and it was called Democracy and Integration, Conflict in Logics. So in a way, she uh, demonstrated how the EU accession uh, of Central and Eastern European countries occurred in such circumstances that created this kind of uh, ground about uh, for the situation about which Ambassador has just said, that there is this narrow space for debate uh, during the integration period because you just need to do things that are done. But once you are in, you kind of forget <laughs> that it's possible to, to create a space for debate without actually jotting the EU as something uh, which is outside or evil or uh, um, an enemy, but just debate about things in the EU being inside it. So uh, this critical space uh, is being uh, probably rolled uh, out uh, because of the expert-like uh, and um, um, pro very professionalized character of, of the um, very integration. But more, more generally, sociologically speaking, any integration is a process of uh, uh, eradicating some differences. It's been true for the industrialization. It's sometimes true for migrant integration. And I guess the European integration is also the acquis communautaire was there idea that you kind of join in some basic uh, rules and so on and so forth. So I guess probably this is the the 
the, the first um, moment when the, the space narrows down too much and, and that's why the skepticism gets the um, the face of being anti-European while it can be uh, Euro corrective instead of just Euro um, fighting. Mm. Ambassador Reiter, Reiter, you were um, you were at that time or post accession, you were in the United States serving as an ambassador, Polish ambassador to the United States. Can you give us some insights into the what what did the um, at that time a Bush administration I think um, thought about this? How what was the relation of this administration towards the the enlargement process? Please unmute, unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry again. Uh, for no instance, no doubt the U.S. has uh, supported uh, the EU enlargement as much as the e as the U.S. has supported the entire project of the European integration. But this, without the uh, U.S. support, this European integration hasn't been uh, uh, could have been uh, as successful as it has been. And there was also a strong support uh, for the EU enlargement uh, uh, that uh, uh, well, was finished in 2004. When I came to the US, I came as an ambassador of an EU country. That meant, for example, I was part of the, of the group of ambassadors who got together every week, actually, or every two weeks, uh, and discussed their experiences, but there was no common position, but there, is, well, there was a, an exchange. Mm, and my experience was uh, in the US from the very beginning. If you want to make yourself interesting, uh, you have to share the story of your country as part of a bigger uh, entity. Because if you just want to share your national story and are representing a, a medium-sized European country, it's a hard competition, and unless dramatic things are happening in your country. And now, of course, dramatic things are happening, not quite in my country, in our country, but next to our country. So, but um, in normal times, you you need a, a, a strong story. And the story, your story is strong if uh, you represent, uh, if, if you share your experience that can be useful for your hosts, uh, in this case, in the US, who are interested in global politics, who are interested in Europe as a major partner in international politics. Uh, so, but I also know from that time, not only from that time, how difficult it has been in Poland to uh, present the country as part of a bigger entity. And but to give you an example from a different um, area, and um, some, 10 years ago, a new museum was opened in Poland, the Museum of uh, uh, the World War II. And then there was the change in government and the new government uh, um, had a totally new concept of this museum. What was their criticism? The criticism was that the museum was not Polish enough, that it was uh, too much well, that the story of the museum was uh, too much embedded in a wider European or, or global story, which was the intention of the founders of the museum, because they their thinking was exactly that if you if you want to attract people from other countries who do not know very much about Polish national history, Polish national history, you have to make your story part of a wider. Uh, story and then you get much more attention. I still believe that this is true. And this antagonism, this conflict over the museum, I think that reflects a lot of uh, well, the changes that uh, have happened in Poland. Um, embedding the Polish story in the European story, that's not popular. That doesn't resonate well in Poland. You rightly mentioned that Poland is not an exception. Poland is not the only country. And the new 
or Eastern members are not the only ones in the European Union. So I believe that what we are uh, experiencing in Poland is part of a wider European problem or phenomenon. But this phenomenon takes, of course, in different forms in each country, and that depends on the history of the country. It takes in Poland exactly the forms that one can, could expect uh, if you uh, predicted uh, this kind of uh, crisis. It's exactly the same uh, language that we know from the past. This is different in Germany, this is different in France, but the, well, the very essence of the problem is uh, the same. But finally, last uh, uh, remark. Um, I think we cannot deny that there is a kind of crisis in the entire European Union. Uh, look, the European Union is envied by many people in the world. But the key question is, by whom is the European Union respected? Where does the European Union enjoy respect? If you want to be respected in countries like India, even more China and so on and so on, you need to, uh, you need to to uh, to you need to impress people by your strengths, by the power of your ideas. And the European Union is unfortunately not in the best shape uh, today. So, um, and I think this is also felt by many people in Europe. So we have to make the Europeans respect the EU again. But the question: How to do that? That's, of course, um, a long story. I'm sorry. <laughs> After two years or three years, you still forget about that. <laughs> um, thank you. I mean, this, this was a very interesting perspective. I must think about you know, the constant tension also in the United States about how are we part of the world or, or how it's a very, very um, present discussion in, in the United States as well. How are we present? How are we, you know, part of the global story or how, you, you know, we should take care of ourselves. Um, um, Anna, I want to turn to you um, as you are also a scholar researching migration and um, as an outcome of the enlargement, uh, you know, there was a huge, and I'm telling this to everyone, there was a huge migration eastward from east to the west. It was at some point, it was over 2 million Polish citizens living and working in United, in United Kingdom and growing numbers to uh, other EU member states. Um, I think in Iceland, which is not a member state, but a member of the European Free Trade Agreement, um, the population, Polish population is around 20, makes around 20% of the whole population. Uh, Netherlands, Germany, of course, has a big uh, Polish population. Um, I wonder if you can say something about, um, you know, the driver, I think we already talked about it a bit, but how did this, did this migration impact how the EU is perceived, how to change the EU, um, uh, you know, how migration was a driver of Europeanization, what can be called as Europeanization? Thank you. I think what... Um... And as the writer just said about respect, it's a very interesting point to think with and to think, to think about it other way around in a way that migration uh, causes exactly the opposite process, that the Europeanization or the importance of Europe is not achieved through um, the moral uh, dimension of uh, the impact of Europe, but through the everyday and very mundane, very day-to-day -day practices. And as you rightly said, there was a big uh, out-migration from, Pol uh, from Poland to the EU, but also the return migration of people with the experience of living in the countries of the EU the UK, Germany, Ireland, who were coming back and uh, bringing what the sociologists call social remittances or cultural remittances, meaning that the experience of life in the EU countries 
were being brought back. And this was reflected then in different forms of um, civic activism, such as tenant uh, movement, tenant rights movement, for example, or um, this was reflected in uh, more um, knowledge about the possibility of living side by side with people from different racial backgrounds and stuff like that. So um, in a way, this day-to-day -day mixing and mingling with uh, the EU that the big um, emigration caused uh, is, is a very interesting uh, daily process of becoming part of the EU and bringing what the EU countries are about back to Poland. Of course, I mean, it might have had the unintended consequences. Brexit rhetoric, uh, the, the run up to Brexit was also anti-migrant, which means that, you know, migration from, from the countries of um, Central Europe might be a part of this anti-EU rhetoric in the UK. But this is a different story. Um, and in a way, this is an important um, part of Europe Europeanization understood as a daily practice of being able to live outside of your nation state and doing it not as a part of seasonal migration where you are stripped of, of all the rights and but as a, a fully rightful member of this other uh, society of course there are different uh, shades of gray so to speak and we hear about the racialization so to speak of of eastern central european migration the COVID showed how say different western european countries were kind of uh, using the fact of the discrepancies in wages and importing the labor force but leaving this all aside still european integration is considered by migration uh, scholars if migration that was caused by uh, the, the opening of the borders and uh, lifting uh, their, uh, their limitations to enter the labor market for the newly uh, um, for the new countries of the EU after 2004 and let us remind Poland uh, was a Polish citizens were able to, to enter the UK Ireland Sweden and the Netherlands right after um, May 1 2004 and countries like Germany opened their labor market seven years later so this this was a great great change in terms of what migration looked like. And uh, on the more anthropological level, people were saying, we are going for a normal, for the normal life. Uh, we want to only work one job and this is possible here in England and not, was not possible in a small Polish town. And if I may just add one other aspect of that very quickly. In the meantime, Poland has also become a country of immigration. And this is called by uh, migration scholars, the demographers like Marek Okulski, uh, the migration transition, which means that instead of being emigration country as it historically had been, Poland now is receiving a lot of people from abroad and it counts about 5% of Polish population at this moment. Uh, which is an unprecedented change. And I would dare say it is a hard fact of Europeanization of Poland because it has, it starts to repeat the modernizations, uh, modernization um, pattern or modernization path of other European countries. And I will stop here. Mm. Well, I, I wish you could develop, uh, but maybe we can uh, talk about it a bit later. But I have here one question and to both of our guests. Um, so migration, you know, you, you talked, Anna, about racialization of um, Eastern European migrants in, in the UK. And, you know, that being par actually a reason for Brexit or one of the big reasons for Brexit to, you know, to, let's take over control over our country. Um, as you know, a part of Europeanization. And on the other hand, if you think about these remittances, these cultural experiences that you, you talked about of the Polish people or Poles making these experiences in quote unquote West, 
what we see now and what the political consequences are are frankly or you know just different uh it's less integration it's the you know um more integritous policies um in most of european countries in italy um poland obviously and i guess hungary is um is an example as well um so I could actually turn it around and say, you know, you, migration as a driver of disintegration, not not Europeanization. Is I think this is something that you know we're um, we're going to uh, struggle um, much much more in 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 current political process and and in the future, Mr. Reiter. Yeah, um, I agree, and uh, I believe that uh, this issue has uh, an enormous destructive potential if it's not addressed the right way. And I'm I'm watching that in Germany, where this is the that's the major issue of uh, German politics, and uh, but there is a growing gap between the public perception of of uh, the migration situation in Germany and uh, the uh, language of the political establishment. And this is uh, a major problem. By the way, um, the Eastern members of the European Union should have a kind of, well, European function because they are best at detecting new uh, moods and so changing moods, fears, and so on. They are very bad at managing these moods and fears, but they are uh, very good at detecting problems that are not, or often not uh, uh, being perceived in the public debate in the uh, West European countries. So the way the, these problems like the problem of migration have been addressed in Hungary and Poland is not a very constructive one, but um, at least but there is the in the public debate this issue is uh, has a strong uh, presence uh, which is much more ambiguous in germany it's different again in france to make the story uh, 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 short this is a major issue and unless europe uh, gets over control over the migration makes people believe that this is under control we will be watching a growing gap between the political mainstream and the right-wing parties that are absolutely uh, that that are very good at exploiting these uh, fears. In we are we are having that in Poland, without the same uh, problem of migration as in Germany or in France, mm, but the fear of losing control that's enough to make people um, uh, distrust the European Union. And uh, so that shows how powerful the, these fears are in Europe. But to, to uh, come back to the question of, well, um, control. So, you know, 20 years ago and more, so before the accession and also in the first years of membership in the EU, in I think in all the Eastern EU countries and also in some old EU countries like uh, Italy, you had a, an interesting phenomenon, namely a higher level of trust in the European institutions compared with the national institutions. So people, and in Poland, this was very strong. So the, the mood was mm, hold us because if you don't hold us, we don't know what we may do. So you have to control us. Uh, if you say that today, but this is a political suicide. This is no longer accepted for reasons that I understand. But this was a very strong uh, part of the European narrative uh, 20 years ago and more. And again, I believe that we failed to realize when this narrative uh, lost its impact, when it's uh, it became a kind of warning signal uh, to the people uh, instead of being a positive uh, force. And uh, I think we are still far 
away from uh, getting a kind of balance between uh, well, national responsibilities and European responsibilities. And this is not just a Polish problem. This is a European problem. Last uh, remark, um, what I think what we have learned is that um, in Europe, in order to be a successful European, you cannot just jump into Europe over your nation state. You need to trust your nation state. You need a well-formatted nation state that people trust. Only then people can identify with the European Union, with Europe. Only then also they can be successful Europeans. Uh, and, well, the Greeks are uh, one example of uh, trying uh, to jump, so to speak, to Europe over the nation states. Failure. The same was a little bit the case in Italy. And we also had that less than in, in other countries, but also had that in Poland. This does not work. And I think that's uh, an important uh, important conclusion that we have to draw from the past experience. But I think you're when you're talking about nation state, it's more an institutional frames than uh, than the cultural drive or that uh, as or or the the frames that drive the culture national culture anna as an anthropologist so what do you think the nation state don't that doesn't die hard in the europeanization process apparently well um when preparing to this meeting to our to our uh, uh, seminar i looked at uh, marisha galbraith's book and she uses the concept of nested identities so when doing anthropological research in the south of Poland among people who uh, speak about themselves as Polish and European at the same time, uh, she she shows that these uh, two um, identities do not, do not need to be necessarily conflictual. But there, of course, mm -hmm. um, this is the uh, ideal uh, case scenario and a very hopeful one and also the one that kind of precedes the major crisis uh, which that which were mentioned just a couple of minutes ago and apart from the so-called migration crisis one can mention the economic crisis or um the great other uh, moments in which europe was considered to go kind of down uh, overburdened by its problems so uh, anthropologically speaking, the, the European project uh, has been very uh, exciting in Polish press uh, in, in the period before the accession, it, Euro European Union or joining the EU was called a thrilling unknown. And it's not no longer possible to imagine such rhetoric uh, today, exactly because the this anticipatory um, weight of the EU has gone somehow. And I guess this is um, the matter of uh, not only uh, the EU changing, but also different nat nation state changing and also the world changing globally um, with the uh, various things going on differently than they used to go on uh, 20 years ago. So uh, nationalism that doesn't die hard. No, uh, it doesn't. But actually, from the very beginning, um, the European Union was imagined uh, through the lens of nation state. For example, the hopes uh, for the EU accession were expressed uh, in terms of what it will give to Poland and mm -hmm. not what it will bring into the EU, for example. So I don't know if it answers the question a bit. Yes, of course. Thanks. I want to, looking at watch, my watch, I want to turn maybe to current state and also um, bring some um, maybe perspective for the future. Um, so Poland before the accession was seen as a eastern border of the West or, and, you know, with, with the accession that changed. And particularly, I guess, after the um, open inv Russian invasion on Ukraine, um, how did that change the dynamics in Poland? The the per the perception of 
shifted borders of the quote unquote West from its Western border to the Eastern border. It's also a question on a place, Polish place in the European Union, on the role that it plays. Ambassador Reiter, please unmute yourself. Sorry, this is an extremely difficult question. Maybe this is the key question in Poland today. And uh, first, the country is enormously inward looking, much more than it was uh, 20 years ago. The country that the paradox is that uh, the country is much more influenced, much more impact in Europe, and it does not realize how much influence it has. And it is a, in, a, in an extremely defensive uh, position. Mm, uh, so there is a gap between the reality and the perception. Mm, second, but there is a growing, and that worries me a lot, there is a growing anti-Western resentment uh, in Poland. Um, but it's, if you watch the uh, public debate, uh, the dominant issue in the election campaign, for example, now is, uh, is Germany. It's not so much Russia, it's Germany. Why is it Germany? But this is a long story, but um, um, because this is about uh, emotions, about perceptions, uh, while Russia is a question of, uh, well, physical security. It's a physical threat. It is perceived as a physical threat, but not a cultural uh, threat, while Germany is perceived as a cultural challenge. And this, and the, the, this activates old Polish complexes, old Polish traumas, so that you, if you watch the Polish debate, you could come to the conclusion that the major problem that the country is having is Germany. How to defend the country uh, against Germany, which is, of course, uh, uh, nonsense. Not that the Germans have done everything right. No, Germany has made a lot of mistakes. But a discussion, debate uh, uh, on these mistakes is impossible because uh, Poland is not in the mood to talk about anything. Poland is accusing and not uh, talking, not discussing. Mm, so uh, mentally, culturally, if you look at, at, at least if you if you watch the public debate, you could come to the conclusion that the country is drifting towards the East. Of course, politically, it's not drifting that much because there is Russia, uh, the aggressor, so people have little appetite for, um, uh, for going together with Russia. But culturally, we can come to a point where Poland will still formally remain member of the European Union, but mentally, it will be kind of alienated in the EU and not really participating in the EU. And this is, of course, politically um, a major threat because the country is now in a very, uh, uh, in a very sensitive geopolitical position, giving the, giving the changes, giving the war in Ukraine, giving the, uh, the rise of the aggressive Russia, and also given the the change is happening in Europe and in the transatlantic relationship. So this is now time for making decisions for the future. And Poland is uh, looking at the, uh, into the past and uh, looking at uh, herself. This may change after the election, but if this does not change, this can bring Poland uh, in, in deep trouble. I still believe that um, there will be a kind of uh, wake up in Poland. We cannot expect that now uh, a few weeks before the election. Never in the past 250 years has Poland had as much influence, as much impact in Europe. Uh, and this is not reflected in the public mood. And it's not reflected in the public discourse. Thank you. Very insightful. Anna, what do you think when you look at the, from the anthropological perspective and um, based on also your previous research? Um, in, in this perspective, I and mean, this future looking is difficult to do based on, on, on research, actually. But I guess in what I will say, I will mostly rely on being incorrigible optimist, probably. And the paradoxical thing, which might be, I, this is purely speculative, but 
um, since we talk about the full-scale war in Ukraine and the invasion of Russia in 2022, one of the um, side effects of it was the application for European membership by, by this country, or at least uh, the, the efforts made to, to um, make this prospect uh, closer. And it may be compared with the um, membership plea by Turkey, and many people say it's far, far to go and so on and so forth. But still, from the point of view of aspirational structures and hope, it means that for some country, which is the neighbor of Poland, uh, EU is something they hope for. It's something where they place their aspirations. And in this respect, and paradoxically, and very sadly, that such price needs to be paid for that, Europe becomes an object of um, hopes again, as it used to be 20 years ago, for, for another country, which is a big neighbor of Poland and which is a very uh, closely linked country to Poland. And now through also so many war refugees who are residing in Poland and who stayed uh, in Poland. So in a way, uh, even if uh, for this um, particular constellation of another country applying or wanting to apply for European membership, I think that gives some hint of hope. And I will not, of course, uh, um, question what uh, Ambassador has just said. Uh, um, you probably know it uh, much better than, than I do. This is not, uh, not really my area, the current politics. But um, I guess it could be like, of course, the electoral talk put aside, it's very brutal and probably shouldn't be overestimated. But if this is taken seriously, that Europe can be a place of hope again, probably this is something good to take out of it. I think this is a very good uh, moment to uh, put a full stop um, with hope, um, you know, in terms of turmoil. Um, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you for very much for your invitation. Thank you for the discussion and all the um, interesting uh, details that you shared with us. Um, I would like to only make a bit of an advertisement, the European Studies Center at the University of Pittsburgh, and I want to refer to what Mr. Uh, Ambassador Reiter said, has received a grant from European Commission, um, Jean Monnet Network, to scrutinize EU external policies and to see, you know, how... Um, the value driven how the the values driven external policies of the eu how they are met outside of the eu and how um what kind of dynamics that um that uh, evokes we will start the grant from um january 1st it's 18 institutions in no 20 institu 21 institutions in 18 member states um, please uh, follow our web page for next iterations of EU enlargement um, uh, lecture series. The next, uh, next iteration is on October 26th. We will uh, host Pavel Telichka, who was a um, negotiator of Czech um, accession to um, United, uh, to European Union, as well as Karol Leff from University of um, Illinois. Um, thank you very much again. Um, the recording of this session will be posted on our webpage and I hope you will um, visit our um, seminar uh, next month. Goodbye. <laughs>